Thank you for spending the next hour with us as we discuss the intersecting and complicated topics of crime, race, and politics in this unusual era of COVID-19. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that last month, Chicago experienced its most violent month in the past 28 years with more than 100 people killed. This is more than double the number of homicides that were killed in July of 2019. Select other cities have had experienced similar trends, upticks in homicides and shootings, while at the same time experiencing downturns in other crimes. So it's clearly an unusual time all around. Protests, police standing down, bail reform, quarantine, quarantine fatigue, these are some of the things that have been blamed for the changes in crime. To those who are steeped in these issues, like our panelists today, the rhetoric, the rhetoric around crime and just important, our society's response to crime harkens back to the tough on crime eras that we've seen long ago, uh, not that long ago. So today's discussion is both about what we know and also about what we don't know. Today we know that simply adding more cops to the street and ramping up incarceration has not worked to make America safer or more fair. Instead, the prison buildup accelerated racial disparities, racial divisions, and, and many have simply lost their trust in law enforcement. So how do we respond both to crime and to the narrative around crime? These are real problems in some communities. Crime and victimization are haunting some uh, inner cities right now and have been for some time. <clears throat> often communities of color. There are long-standing problems of racial segregation, barriers to education, barriers to jobs, poor health care, and general neg neglect of whole swaths of our society. So today our panel includes Rich Richard Rosenfeld, who's a curator's distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at U University of Minnesota, uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis, Pam Rodriguez, President and CEO of TASC Incorporated. TASC stands for Treatment Alternatives for Safer Communities, which is a succinct description of the work they do, advocating on behalf of individuals engaged with the justice system who are facing problems that would better be addressed through a public health approach. And third is Jody Dar Armour, whose most recent accomplishment is his just released book, which he'll tell you about. Jody is a Roy P. Crocker Professor of Law at the University of Southern California Gold School of Law. And I am Ashley Nellis. I'm a senior research analyst at the Sentencing Project, where, I, where our organization focuses on race um, and sentencing and trying to find a more fair and rational approach to public safety. So the format, uh, uh, so that you know what you've gotten yourself into, is that we'll launch right into a Q&A um, in a format that selects uh, uh, any of the panelists to join in, but also um, I'll give some probing questions to get us going. Uh, we'll also, in about 30 minutes or so, open it up for public questions. Uh, we ask that you please put your questions in the question box rather than in the chat, because I probably won't see it in the chat. Um, and so uh, I think with that, we'll just uh, begin. I wanted to ask if maybe Rick would start us off by, um, you know, giving us sort of a lay of the land in terms of uh, the crime uh, trends that we've been seeing this year, uh, since he's been focusing on this since before the pandemic hit. And, um, and then we can just sort of take it from there. Thank you, Ashley, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm honored to be uh, a participant in this endeavor. <clears throat> I conducted a study uh, with a colleague, uh, Ernesto Lopez, uh, for the Council on Criminal Justice, looking at crime rate changes during the pandemic period up through the end of June. And please keep that in mind, our data end at the end of June. Uh, and we can talk about uh, subsequent developments, but uh, that's when our systematic assessment ends. Um, and here's what we found. Looking at 27 large cities, we found that during the early period of the pandemic, or specifically the response to the pandemic, 
uh, we saw big declines in crimes of nearly all types, not all types, uh, <clears throat> very large declines in residential burglary. Uh, when people are at home, uh, we get fewer burglaries because burglars tend to avoid occupied households. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, during business clothing, uh, closings, shoplifting is no longer an option, and so we saw big declines in larceny. Uh, we saw some decline in motor vehicle theft, and we also saw some decline in, in many cities in violent crimes. Um, those property crime reductions have persisted or did persist through the end of June, and everything I know suggests they've continued to persist. But violent crime went up. Uh, homicides and aggravated assaults, aggravated assaults or serious assaults that uh, threaten or uh, produce serious bodily injury. Um, by the end of May and through June, uh, those two crimes spiked. Uh, I should also say that during a single week at the end of May, and this was the week after George Floyd's killing in Minneapolis, we saw a big spike in commercial burglary. And that we attribute to uh, the sporadic uh, looting and breaking and entering that occurred in some places at the very beginning of mass protests against police violence. But I should say that that abrupt spike ended as abruptly as it began. In the following week, we saw commercial burglaries return to their more normal levels for that time of the year. And so claims that looting and violence have been widespread throughout the protest period uh, are not supported by our data. But we did see an increase in violence, both homicide and aggravated assault we're up considerably over last year, so we're taking seasonal effects into account. We also saw an increase in domestic violence, uh, as many people uh, were um, suggesting would happen during the pandemic. We did see an increase, but we couldn't establish a connection between the pandemic or the response to the pandemic and the increase in domestic violence. That's because the increase in domestic violence that we saw uh, was no greater than the increase last year or the year before that, for that matter. So while it's very important to respond to all violence increases and certainly including domestic violence, we could not unambiguously connect that increase to uh, the response to the pandemic. So in a nutshell, those are our major findings. And as we move on, I'm happy to talk about uh, our more speculative uh, interpretations of our results. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and this is for all three to weigh in to sort of open up a conversation here. Um, calls for police reform with some calling for departments to be defunded now come at a time where there's been an uptick in violence in places like Chicago, Kansas City, Philadelphia, and others. So how can we address violent crime while also responding to the needs to reform the police? And does defunding the police address the need for police when it comes to violent crime? Yeah, well, it is inopportune, isn't it, in, in a lot of ways that as we're having this debate, the, the violent crime rate is increasing in some areas, which is giving support to a kind of more law and order proponents in the debate. Um, and there's no real, there's no tight connection between anything that's been proposed now by way of defunding the police and these Bikes, any that you can identify in crime of any kind, including, including violent crime, right? Because the defunding proposals haven't been enacted. None of them, um, some of them haven't even made it through, you know, uh, uh, some small process steps that you have to take to get toward enactment. So, you, you know, a lot of people, I've had even folks in law enforcement talk to me about, well, isn't there, there proof that the defunding proposals decrease our safety isn't there proof in the fact that 
there's these crime spikes at the time there's been this defunding. There's been no defunding, folks. I, I have to say that plainly. People don't seem to quite get it in a, a lot of lay folks. We need to make it clear to people what the facts are. And the facts are there has been no defunding. So any correlations or connections you can find between any increases in crime now and anything doesn't have to do with any defunding. Uh, that has actually happened. It, it may have to do with some other factors that we can uh, to, that we can get into, like the legitimacy and credibility of law enforcement itself, and whether that's connected to spikes in crime, which have been demonstrated. Um, but uh, I think I just wanted to make that point because I think a lot of lay folk uh, confuse the two. I think I would add to that or amp the fact that defund the police implies that the savings are reinvested in communities to build capacity for communities to respond to the concerns they have about violence and the concerns they have about crime and crime prevention and crime reduction. And that hasn't happened either. So if, if, we ha if the conversation is just one-sided and all we're talking about is defunding the police and we don't see um, proportionate and perhaps even greater investments in communities to compensate for the years of disinvestment, um, we, we will not be doing a true experiment in this regard either. One of the cautions I would throw out specific to the conversations regarding reinvestments in communities is that the justice reinvestment movement that talked about criminal justice reform and taking cost savings associated with reductions in prison commitments were to be reinvested in community resources. And what was discovered is that a lot of that money ended up being reinvested in the justice system itself. And so even as we think about what reinvestment looks like, we have to be really careful um, to follow the money and see where it goes and ensure that communities actually get to build capacity to address the concerns um, regarding crime. I'd like to follow up, uh, Ashley, if you don't mind, on a point that Jody made. Uh, there are concerns out there, just as there were five years ago, approximately, after Ferguson and Baltimore and Chicago uh, 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 protests uh, against police violence in those days. There are concerns that police officers are angered, they're frustrated, <clears throat> they're concerned about increased legal liability, and so they're drawing back, and that's contributed to the crime rise. And I think there's some spotty evidence for that in a few places, no systematic evidence that I'm aware of, especially when you think about <clears throat> the real impact on police activity that the pandemic has had and our social response to the pandemic. <clears throat> There's no question that police activity has declined. And by activity, I mean <clears throat> patrols by officers, um, uh, asking people questions on the street, uh, social distancing uh, policies and requirements, officers out on quarantine because they have the virus or they're exposed to someone with the, uh, they've been exposed to someone with the virus. Those have had a real impact on the kinds of activities that the police can engage in in a fair and equitable way that can reduce crime. So that's the impact on police behavior. And it's far greater, it seems to me, than any impact of police frustration or anger might have had on so-called de-policing. You know, this reminds me of, um the conversation uh, from last week when uh, we were talking about, you know, the, co the comment of sort of what do communities that are experiencing uh, these spikes in violent crime and homicides, what do they need? Um, and I think it was Pam who was saying that in Chicago, uh, the communities are going to, um, you know, Kim Fox and saying, we need, we need to be able to trust that when we talk to the police, we're gonna, they're going to have our back. And, um, you know, that there's, there is a role for law enforcement um, in, in these uh, crime, uh, ex, you know, these communities that are experiencing crime, but, and, and the community is being very clear about what they need, um, but it's not getting across, right? And so I wonder, Pam, if you could talk a little bit about that. So um, Kim Fox is our progressive prosecutor here in Chicago. And um, you know, the, 
there's been a lot of conversation about um, why communities don't help police and and reveal who they suspect or know to have been perpetrators of crime, particularly violent crimes, particularly murders. And um, while, while folks um, criticize a, a culture of, of uh, avoiding being a snitch, right, and not uh, revealing what they know about who's committed a crime, the fact is that there's real risk in doing that. The fact, and, and if I do help police with an investigation that takes a year or two years to prosecute, um, can I be assured of my own safety? And so in that regard, several community advocates and organizations have come together to ask our prosecutor to find a better way to guarantee their safety. Um, and, and that's a really hard thing to promise. That's a really hard thing to do. Police aren't available 24 seven. Police, um, you know, aren't available. And so they're asking for help with witness protection. And maybe there's a different way to do witness protection. But that's one of the things that the community here in Chicago has um, offered as a, as, a, as a piece of the solution to solving uh, some of the murders that are going unsolved at an incredibly high rate. And I can say just real quickly, if some of those resources are going toward programs like beefed up witness protection, um, rather than toward turnstile jumpers, for example, say in New York, or toward broken windows policing um, in a lot of other cities, including my own LA, then that's what defund the police is all about. If we reallocate resources, we can get a lot more done a lot better. Uh, reduce the the, the Amount of, amount of funds we put into policing and then take the funds we do put into policing and put it into smart, good policing. It takes a lot of investigative work to solve murders and rapes, et cetera. Give them those necessary resources. There's no excuse for rape kit backlogs and all that stuff. You know, when we have budgets that can get to that if our priorities were right and our yeah. priorities haven't been right. And that's what the defunding debate has really been about once you get beyond the scare tactics of the language that seems to make people think, oh, we're just going to abolish the police, which is not what most defunders are saying. Right. I would add that, and I'll speak as a researcher here, um, <clears throat> we need lots of experimentation that should begin this afternoon or tomorrow about just what tasks the police currently perform that even the police agree they're ill-suited to perform. Dealing with mental health issues among the homeless, uh, responding to drug overdose, which are clearly health or medical emergencies. Now those would seem like the kind of tasks I would also add routine traffic control around if, if they ever come back, big crowd events like sporting events. It's never been clear to me why the fire department couldn't help out with some of that. In any event, there are lots of, I think, very reasonable proposals out there. What we need to do is put them in action in city after city after city, and then compare best practices across cities. Which ones can be reallocated first and to whom? How much additional staffing will be needed in that other area? How much that will cost? Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Jody, that <clears throat> People join the police department by and large, not so they can watch a free baseball game because they're on traffic control, but be, to address, to prevent, and when prevention fails, to investigate serious crime. That's what we want. I think that's what everyone want, in, wants, including the police, the police to do. So I see common ground here. There's not much common ground, it seems, when you read the headlines. But I really see common ground between rank and file officers who say all the time, I'm sure they've said it to each of you, hey, we're not social workers. This is not mm -hmm. what we were trained to do. Precisely so. Mm -hmm. So there's common ground to move forward uh, and do the kind of experimentation that will tell us just how much we can, quote, defund the police and just how much capacity we need to build in other areas to take over those functions. Yeah, we made police our street level social workers here in LA, for example, in a program called the Safer Cities Initiative in 2006, in which we put a lot more police in Skid Row 
to solve the problem of homelessness. We were going to solve the problem of homelessness, right? Here's how we were going to solve it. We were going to crack down on the down and out in, for their own good in the name of therapeutic policing that's going to send them to these mega shelters so that they get in these kind of 12-step programs because obviously to the you know, architects of this Safer Cities initiative, the problem of homelessness isn't a lack of affordable housing or a lack of jobs or a lack of health care. It is internal deficiencies in people who lack personal responsibility. And so they need to be repaired and sent to these mega shelters and we'll crack down on them. We'll give them citations, put them in handcuffs and they can get rid of the citations by going to the mega shelters and going through the 12 step program. And then we did that from 2006 to basically now but well through 2012, 13, 14, and look where it got us, you know. And the police were made into street-level social workers. They didn't want that task in the first place. Many of them didn't, and yet it was imposed on them. And then we, we preordained their failure by having them solve problems that we should have solved through those kind of interventions, affordable housing, health care, et cetera, rather than making police them, you know, our, 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 re our resolution and our, our jail cells, the receptacles of our failures, our social mm -hmm. failures. I want to I want to tie those two comments together. I do think there needs to be experimentation, um, and I uh, in, in cities across the country to figure out you know what the right balance is, et cetera. But I also want to say we do know what works to address homelessness. It's affordable housing. We do know what works to reduce adolescent involvement in crime. It's engagement in schools and jobs. We do know what works with regard to reducing juvenile justice system involvement, and that's supporting families so that we don't lose our children in foster care settings, et cetera. So I, I also wanna say we do know a lot about what works to address these problems and to solve these problems and to prevent them. And it's, it's a, you know, the public, has to shift the conversation and the focus to that and not look for simple, quick um, solutions to what are, what are long-term results of disinvestment, et cetera. And so we have to have, we have to respond to the violence and the rapes and murders, et cetera. We absolutely must do that. But we also need to balance that with what we know works to prevent all of the, um, all of the despair that we see in so many communities. And I think if I could just weigh in, you know, this was a comment that Rick has made when it comes to reforming the police. Um, you know, we also know what works there, uh, which is accountability. And, um, you know, Rick, if you want to mention a few things about that, because a lot of what we're hearing right now is, you know, they need more training, they need to de-escalate. And there's, you know, decades of research on policing. People do study the policing uh, in the industry. Um, you know, for their whole careers. And there's, there's a lot of good evidence about what works to improve policing. Right, there's this despair about training we hear now. Well, you know, why do the police violate the precepts uh, and procedures they, they learn in the academy and through in-service training? <clears throat> and that's because there's not sufficient accountability uh, when a violation occurs that people are held accountable. Uh, that would encourage people to recall their training. I use the example of students in a class, say a law, a law school class, Jody, and uh, they're asked to review the material, but they're never given an exam. They're never asked to be accountable. Now, some students will retain the material, but many, many more will not retain it to the degree they would if they were held accountable. The same is true for any occupation, and that includes policing. So training by itself is simply not sufficient to implement the kinds of reforms that I think all of us would agree need to be made. <clears throat> Police have to be held accountable, just as we are all held accountable for the training we receive in our other jobs. You know, one of the things I, I try to get into in my uh, new book that uh, just dropped yesterday is that the way we look at black people and police come into contact disproportionately with black people, right? All you have to do is look at the jail cells when I take my students up to San Quentin to get a sense of the demographics of our jails and prisons. 
you, re you really get to see how raced policing is in America. And if, if once you understand the racial dimension of policing, then you understand how important it is that the police have a certain image of the people they're policing or what their image of the people they're policing is. But not only what is the, what, what, what are the police's, what, what, what are the images that police have of the people they're policing? What are the images that ordinary voters and politicians and other people who regulate the police, who determine whether they're gonna be held accountable, who determine who's gonna be the mayor who hires the chief, who then you know, implements the policies. Mm -hmm. A lot of ordinary citizens have a lot of anti-blackness in them too. That's what's coming out of these George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, you know, marches, this, this uh, generational upheaval moment we're in is this recognition that black lives haven't mattered. You know, the reason my work is titled Nigger Theory, um, Race, um, uh, Language, Unequal Justice in the Law is we have, when it comes to especially criminals, black criminals, we've otherized them, monsterized them, demonized them, niggerized them, I've called it. And, and that robs them of our sympathy, care, and concern, and empathy. And then that affects our policing policy. That affects who we hold accountable, how much we hold them accountable, how much we put whose feet to the fire, right? And so part of this problem has to do with us collectively now, societally, reckoning with do we really value black lives who disproportionately these police are coming into contact with? And what would it look like if we did? Yeah. Right? What would change if we actually valued black lives? What would change if we believed the stories of people who, who have um, in Chicago been, you know, forced into um, confessions that were not uh, actually real regarding the crimes they um, that were committed and we're spending millions and millions of dollars every year for wrongful convictions as a result of that because we didn't believe people coming to the justice system who said they were coerced into a false confession and so it, i mean that's a really simple example of what would look different if we believed um, black people who tell us what's what's happening in communities yeah, I, I saw um, something that you had written, uh, Jody, where um, you had made the comment that there's a group of us who think that you're uh, bad because you're poor, and a group of us that think you're poor because you're bad. And it sort of depends on which one you fall into, and then the criminal justice response, um, you know, goes that way, and it, and it falls on racial lines. Right. And that's why, again, I, I recognize there's the, this N-word is a blood-soaked epithet that has deep roots and a racist history and has been used to demean, demoralize, and dehumanize Blacks for a long time. I'm not, I'm not using it lightly, but I think it's important for us to recognize the power it has to focus our attention on what our moralizing is doing to our fellow citizens and to our society. When you have someone like Chris Rock, which is one of the places I got the title nigger theory from, who back in the 90s went back and forth in front of an all black audience and said, you know, it's like a civil war going on in black America and there's two sides, there's black people and there's niggas. And niggas have got to go. I love black people, but I hate niggas. Boy, I wish they'd let me join the Ku Klux Klan. I'd do a drive by from here to Brooklyn. And he kept going like that for a half hour. And his core definition of a so-called nigga N word was a black criminal a morally condemnable black criminal. That's how even black people were talking about black criminals in the 90s. Hillary Clinton wasn't the only one talking about super predators in the late 90s or in the 90s. There were a lot of black, black people making the same noise as Chris Rock was about black criminals, right? And there's been a shift in the Overton window. We can't forget how not very long ago we demonized, and, and it's not that far from even uh, us going back to that now, we really thought that criminals were toxic human waste that we needed to warehouse and not feel any sympathy, care, and concern for, what, for um, whatsoever. And we're, we're in a little different place now. We could easily go back to that other place that we were, and we need to figure out what it was that got us in that place before. And what I'm trying to say is part of it was this racial factor, this factor that when we put a black face on crime, like with um, Willie Horton, it's easier for people to demonize the criminals. Um, 
I know there's uh, there have been a lot of comments so far in the um, in the comment in the Q and A, and if I could summarize a bunch of them, it would be that uh, uh, attendees are are wondering sort of how do you distill the information about how you need mental health and substance abuse and education and residential integration um, to a lay audience. Uh, so this question comes from somebody working in the media and wants to know how to convey clear and simple ways to, you know, describe this approach to regular folks, non-activists, and where is there proof that it has worked? That's sort of one of the topics and related to that is if we're going to move, um, you know, resources to communities that really need them, how do we, how, how do you all recommend that we make that leap without there being a gap in the middle? Um, I think Rick sort of addressed this a bit by saying we start small and move slowly across uh, communities. We don't just defund the police and then figure out what to do next. Um, so I thought maybe just to, uh, to address um, a handful of these questions, maybe you all had some thoughts about those items. Well, let me, uh, if you don't mind, begin uh, picking up on something Pam said. Um, uh, I agree with you, Pam. There are some areas in which we need no longer uh, experiment. We know the answer. We know that uh, the provision of employment is uh, an antidote to joblessness. We know that income maintenance is an antidote to low to poverty. These are things we know. And indeed, there's some conservative liberal uh, consensus on, uh, on some of this. So <clears throat> I would say when it comes to providing jobs to the jobless, when it comes to maintaining incomes, when it comes to strengthening our social safety net, the era of experimentation is long over. Uh, what we need are the policies to implement that, and those I do not think should be local or piecemeal. They have to be <clears throat> implemented, I think, at the federal level. Our, we cannot rely on our cities, even our relatively wealthy cities like LA and New York and Chicago. We cannot rely on the cities alone to provide jobs in the communities where joblessness is is uh, so high uh, to maintain incomes, to improve education. This all requires a federal effort and the effort should be universalistic. I'm thinking now of William Julius Wilson, who uh, now a generation ago made it clear the best policies are universalistic policies. What he meant by that was policies that do not exclude anyone so that everyone buys in. It's, he made the uh, comparison to Social Security and Medicare. These are universalistic policies and therefore they don't invite the kind of attacks that we've seen traditionally on social welfare policies. So uh, no experimentation needed when it comes to the long-term solutions uh, to ameliorate the conditions that we, I think we all know give rise to chronically high levels of violence. You know, even when it comes to universalistic um, programs, Rick, I hear everything you're saying. I, I think you're spot on right. But I think it's important for us to recognize how race has figured in our, our lack of support for them. Yeah. Right? That is... Um, you know, the right and people on the left, it's been bipartisan over the last 30 years or more, have been, uh, the right has been especially effective at characterizing social safety net programs as handouts to blacks, right? The Cadillac driving welfare queen mother who goes and gets her AFDC trope drove the Reagan campaign the first time around, right? And we've seen iterations of that and reiterations since. And so now, even, white, even though whites um, benefited numerically in greater numbers from something like AFPC than black folk, um, they were convinced um, that, you know, uh, AFDC was something, a handout, a dole for blacks and supported it's, uh, it's elimination and a lot of other programs that in absolute numbers would have um, helped uh, whites more 
um, because of the rates of poverty in the black community may have disproportionately helped blacks, but maybe the majority of beneficiaries would still be whites, but because it was given a black face, they withdrew support, right? And so we always have to deal with that, again, moment that's tying all these other moments together in which we see in the streets, that to really do something about the most maligned and marginalized poor people in our society, we have to get rid of this anti-blackness that is being used to tar all, um, you know, help programs that help the needy. We have to do them both at the same time. We both have to fight for the needy and fight anti-blackness so that we can see how they're connected and how both fights to complement each other. And in the needy are a bunch of white folks. Yes. So, and, 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 and by, by the numbers, way more. And, and, and so the fact that the, some folks have been really effective in drawing that line along racial lines, as opposed to income supports that would lift up all kinds of folks of, of all kinds of backgrounds in all corners of this country, rural in particular right? There's a ton of rural poverty that is hidden from all of us. Black, white, brown, it, it, there, and we, we have racialized it. We absolutely have, and we've otherized it. I'm, I'm an AFDC kid, okay? My, my mom got AFDC. We got healthcare. We got good education. We got all that kind of stuff because we were poor white folks, right? It was it lifted us up out of poverty. It lifted up my whole family out of poverty. It's fantastic. We should be supporting families across the board so they can do that. Now, the question about where's, what about money? Where do we pay for this? Um, I agree with the notion that this needs to be universal. Um, I will tell you that how we're doing it, how, what we're going to do in Illinois. We legalize marijuana and we tax the heck out of it. And that, that, 25% of all that revenue is coming right back to the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, over-policing, over-incarceration, et cetera. So we are, it's new revenue, it's new money, and it's going into um, investments, both short-term as in violence reduction, but also long-term as in building housing, building um, relationships with banks, building uh, uh, other employment opportunities for folks. Um, for the long term. And so it's a, it's a revenue stream that's going to exist for a while that should enable us to make some of the investments we're talking about without drawing money away from other um, priorities that the state might have. So maybe. I wanted to, um, while we're um, on the topic of the importance of race in this whole discussion about violence and police and community social services and all, um, remind us all, which doesn't take much reminder of the current political climate that we're in and the current administration. So it doesn't take uh, much to find some uh, quotes from President Trump um, saying that we are, some communities are living in a war zone, um, that they need federal agents to come in and clean up these democratic cities, um, that there's been a left-wing war on cops, and also uh, most, I think most, the most stinging comment, uh, although I don't have, I haven't heard all of them, is that, um, he, that if we don't address the rise in crime in these ways, then essentially black people are going to move to the suburbs and attack white suburban women. I mean, that's basically what he said about 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, white suburban women are necessary for his vote in November. Um, but I think even if, <laughs> even if they weren't, he would have said it. Um, so, you know, there is a real, there's a real n narrative out there that is, um, you know, I'd like to think as a society, we've really moved past the super predator era The you know, we're just, we, some of us just look back and say, wow, how could we have ever thought that, you know, crack should have given, get more punishment than powder cocaine. But I think if, if, you know, if we're not careful, we could, we could end up with some of this again, because it's being led uh, at the, at the federal level with this kind of language. And, you know, a lot of the um, people's positions have been filled with, um, you know, those who have the similar mindset. So I guess my question to you is, you know, 
just generally, how do we deal with that? And also um, specifically uh, about the federal agents moving into some of these cities um, and you know, what you all think about that as a, as a response um, to violent crime. Well, you go there's and a remedy. Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> there's a remedy to um, um, the, uh, it's beyond tone deaf to the current administration. And that remedy is coming up in approximately two months. Um, on the uh, movement of federal agents to cities like Chicago, my own city of St. Louis, Kansas City, Portland, and elsewhere, um, <clears throat> Uh, I would make two points. First of all, any idea or supposition that cities, city police departments have not been cooperating with federal agencies, uh, law enforcement and other, DEA, FBI, ATF, these days Customs and Border Control, uh, is just plain uh, silly. Uh, in, it's certainly incorrect. So the question is, uh, what's gone wrong with those partnerships that we need additional federal agents, in particular federal agents who are not trained uh, uh, in local policing, who have no knowledge of the local area. Um, it's, it's from a criminological point of view, it's just mind blowing to think that uh, a couple of hundred of folks who are not trained and unfamiliar with the area are gonna help out very much. And in fact, if you look at the evidence across the cities that have now hosted these agents for a few weeks, I don't see evidence of any uh, important successes. I think it was a political move, pure and simple. Uh, and I'm not opposed to uh, local federal partnerships. They're in existence in all of the cities that we live in. Some are good, some not so good, but they do exist. Um, you can strengthen the good, good ones uh, without bringing in federal agents who are ill-suited to the task. It was a grandstanding photo op. Um, and voting is the best way to uh, address the issue at least in the um, near future. But I also think that uh, someone said that there's media on this call. Um, I think it is important that when the press report um, on these issues to suburban newspapers and white women, that they call out the obvious race baiting, the obvious dog whistles, the obvious um, error in the facts or the, the, the um, images that are presented versus the facts of the case. And so good reporting is an incredible um, tool in this environment. And, and we still rely on um, good reporters and good press to get real information out to the public. Um, I will also say that I live in a white suburb and I'm a white woman. I don't live in a white suburb, it's a mixed suburb. But, um, and I am pleasantly surprised, um, but I am surprised, but I am pleasantly surprised to see how many folks are activated as a result of what's been going on this summer and activated in a very progressive way and in a very um, much more uh, thoughtful uh, way with regard to the impact of race and policing in communities of color and um, our role as uh, as white folks in that regard. So I'm not saying that's, you know, a guarantee that um, there, uh, my neighbors won't vote for, um, for the current uh, occupant of the White House, but um, many of them did last time and fewer of them for sure will this time based on what they've seen. So we will see, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping of course you're right. Um, but one of the chapters in my book is dedicated to what explains Trump's success in 2016. And I go to the political scientists and I drag out the correlation coefficients. All oh, right. Oh, oh, I, I drag absolutely. Them out, all right. <laughs> and I'm telling you, they aren't there with the economic indicia. They just aren't. I, I, I have a whole chapter. You know, I won't go. I, I'll just give you the executive summary right now. I have receipts. You can pick them apart, you know. But at the end of the day, um, 
only one third of whites who voted for Trump were making under fifty thousand. This old idea of you know the, the mid west, you know, working class, which they typically mean under fifty thousand household income a year. Um, only a third of his support came from families making fifty thousand uh, households making fifty thousand or less. Uh, uh, white households making fifty thousand or less. Another third came from those making fifty thousand to a hundred thousand, and another third came from white households making over a hundred thousand. Two thirds of his support came from better off whites. Only Mitt Romney had a higher average income voter for him. You know, when you look at all the numbers, what what explains Trumpism isn't economic anxiety or or, or, or worry about you know um, economic matters, but it's rather existential anxiety, concern mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. existential annihilation that I didn't understand before I had to write this chapter. And you start to realize that um, for many white people, they have a social identity that they've been able to embrace since the inception of this country. And that's, that is being a member of the dominant social group. Since the inception of this country, they've been a member of the dominant social group. And they are being told through all this talk about inclusion, diversity, and equity, and all the rest, that we're going to try to change the hierarchy so that there's more horizontal relationships rather than vertical between groups. So you'll no longer be a member of the dominant social group. You'll just be one of a, a, a member of, of, of many groups, you know, and we'll all kind of be equal. You just ask somebody to abandon their social identity. You know, which to them, you know, Du Bois calls it the wages of whiteness. Can the psychic wages of that, the psychic benefits, can be like having oil wells pumping in your backyard, right? Or gold mines digging in your front yard, right? So, you know, what Trump pr promised and offered was to reinforce this, the racial hierarchy of your. Make America, you know, what it was, has been historically in terms of the racial hierarchy. I'm going, I, you know, they're trying to, you know, when I used to hear white genocide, it made no sense to me. I've been to Auschwitz and Treblinka. I know what real ovens look like, what real genocide looked like. But what they meant was, I, I come to understand, a not, you know, kind of annihilation, existential annihilation as the kind of person, the social group I am, the dominant you know, social group, that's going away. I don't want to go, I, I'm, I'm not going there. I'm not going, I'm not going quietly into that night. And, and you're, I don't disagree at all. I'm saying I've seen some of those same folks confront that and come out on a different side. That's what I'm saying. Good. We're getting lots of really, really good questions in here and I'm trying to, um, you know, prioritize some, uh, without reading while we're all on this panel. So um, one of the questions uh, is if we were to just focus more of our police force resources on, um, you know, what's, what's absolutely necessary to solve crime. Um, two questions relate to that. Uh, well, the, the one that a person asks is, does this have run the risk of um, fostering a, sort of more of a warrior culture in the police? Um, so I guess the counter to that is having these lower level job uh, tasks may keep them uh, more, um, you know, l less, of, less of sort of like a, more easy to handle as law enforcement officers and less uh, warrior type. I think that's a reasonable concern, especially given the militarization that we've seen of policing in the last generation. Um, but I don't think that uh, focusing police attention on serious crime necessarily leads to greater militarization. In fact, I would, uh, I would say uh, something like the opposite is probably uh, more likely. Uh, if the police are focused on serious crime, their first task is prevention. And uh, what the research in criminology and economics and elsewhere shows is that the police are capable of preventing certain kinds of crime without uh, spreading that crime to adjacent communities and without um, uh, a militarized occupation type presence in communities. 
so uh, no, I don't think that um, we're going to get more militarization as we ask the police or require the police to focus their attention on preventing as well as solving serious crime. Crime prevention, first and foremost, means to me uh, that we have to improve police community relations, especially with communities of color, disadvantaged communities of color, where both police violence and community violence tends, tend to be concentrated. Uh, and that requires police officers to get out of their vehicles, get on the streets, knock on doors, and simply ask people what are your problems and how can we work together to solve them over and over and over again? They'll be rebuffed, especially in certain communities these days, and they need to go back and continue to go back. The police hold periodic community meetings all the time. That's simply not sufficient. Police officers will tell you the same folks show up. Uh, it's usually retired people and they show up to the meeting each month. This requires of each officer getting out of the vehicle and getting to meet people. It strikes me that that's the opposite of militarization and it's gonna be a long slog, uh, but it's absolutely necessary to, uh, that we improve police community relations in order to stem uh, uh, the increase in violence. And I think it's one of the most pressing uh, uh, reforms that we need right now. I just worry a little, I must admit, uh, Rick, who I, whose analyses I find incredibly helpful and, and, and persuasive. Um, but on, in this one, I have to push back. Um, I don't want a police officer knocking on my front door. I've had police officers knock on my front door and draw guns on me when I walked out after I had the afro, there was, there was a period I went on sabbatical and I just didn't make any trips to the hair architects and I grew this fro because <laughs> I wasn't thinking about, you know, you go, when you're writing, you go into a no ear, water, or food zone. So I, you know, I was in that zone and I came out, you know, kind of looking, you know, uh, like this in a, in a sweatshirt and some jeans and I didn't look like I belonged here to those police officers who were just making a friendly neighborhood check and drew guns on me. You know, and so I, 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 I think I speak for a lot of other black folk I've talked to in LA who are concerned about police getting too cozy with them um, and knocking on their you know, front doors or kind of dropping in to, on their picnics or what have you. you know, I hear what you're saying. You're not saying that and, I'm, I'm, and, and so much, but, but some do. They, they take it there and that's all, that's all we need to, to resolve you know, kind of community uh, um, police uh, problem. I, I, I think what a lot of folks would say here is we just need to, you know, Bel Air and Brentwood don't have police driving up and just knocking on doors. Hey, we happen to be in the neighborhood. We want you to get to know. No, <laughs> they would not want them doing that. You know, what? And instead, we want, we really want you to solve the violent crime. We really want to build the confidence, confidence and trust so that we can start working together to that end and figure out what it's going to take for us to get there. Okay, that's, the, that's a fair point. But the question then is exactly how should the police proceed to build the trust and confidence uh, that both you and I think is essential for effective policing? And uh, Stop getting better... caught on tape abusing people. Stop getting caught on tape abusing protesters. Stop getting brought, caught on tape abusing non-protesters, ordinary citizens. You got to stop, 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 you know, having all these officers caught on, you know, and, and, and all kinds of uh, compromising situations with their social media statements and all, and all the rest. You know, um, uh, in, in, in L.A. here, you know, we had um, the, the, the chief, uh, the, the head sheriff, and 19 other lieutenants and captains and sergeants on down uh, convicted of felonies just a couple years ago. So, you know, clean up your police department, get rid of the rogue elements that are more than just a few bad apples. That starts to build the trust and confidence. That goes a long way. Okay. And, and I, 
And I would I think say it gets to the, you know, the accountability that was mentioned. That's earlier. what I was going to say. Yes. And a number of comments in the yes. uh, question box have asked about unions and how unions really stand in the way of having the relationship between the community and the police that is uh, trust in both directions. Um, and that, uh, you know, that their protection of um, what happens in the police departments uh, in these communities um, is really what needs to go. So what do you do you all think that unions, uh, police unions play a significant role in all of this? I do uh, mm -hmm. right now, uh, but I don't think it has to be that way. I'm a supporter of police unions. What I do not support are police unions that are operated by and on the behalf of older white police officers. Okay. If police unions were genuinely integrated um, uh, with representatives of black police officers associations, which we find in big cities across the country, they don't have the status of uh, unions in most cases, uh, but there are a fertile bed of p uh, police officers who are reform minded. They need to be represented in police unions. So I support unions. Uh, I don't support the current leadership that we see in police unions across the country. And, and in that, um, I think, okay, let's use the contract to change the incentives. There are very perverse incentives in policing. Um, there are incentives for numbers of arrests, not good arrests, not convictions. Right. The incentives are for the number of stops and the number of arrests you, you perform. So we and whether it's a felony what we or ask or for, right? We right. get what we, we measure. So renegotiate contracts with unions reflecting the community's priorities for solving crime, right? For solving violent crime, for good arrests and, and build accountability. And I think Rick started out with accountability way at the beginning. There has to be accountability for the, the rogue behavior, the behavior that, that Jody is talking about, the behavior we've all seen. The, you know, it's what we've seen on, on, on video, what we have seen with George Floyd is so, heartbreaking and tragic and for those of us who have been paying attention sadly not surprising but has turned out to be a surprise for a lot of folks in this country and so now we have I think um, some very small window of opportunity to make some significant changes in the things that we've been talking about today and we can't waste this moment because as Americans our attention span is very short. And, and, and we do probably, only have a couple minutes, so I just want to give it over to Jody, um, but make that brief enough. Just real quick, real quick, yeah. Yes. Uh, what about this connection between accountability and representation? Um, because I heard what Rick was saying about, you know, it'd be nice if, for example, we had more black officers in these unions, but um, you look at someplace like Baltimore where Freddie Gray had his neck broken in that rough ride, three of the six officers were black. There are a lot of black officers involved in brutality against black citizens. Uh, you know, the, 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 the split isn't black and white when it comes to Black Lives Matter. It's black and blue. You know, whoever puts on that blue uniform, whatever their social identity, it's adversarial to the black community's interests, right? Um, and that when they, those interests of that, those people in those blue uniforms, whatever their color, gender, or other background factor, their, uh, their, their interests are, for example, to get protection from prosecution. <laughs> you know, uh, we, 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 if, if, we, if we can avoid, you know, um, getting any kind of criminal liability for doing our jobs, we want that part of our job contract, okay? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I'm going to give money to prosecutors who aren't going to prosecute people like me. My, through my union, you know, um, and all of those kind of structural factors that, you know, make it, I think, something that, you know, I'm a big union guy, too, and you can't be a union person, and then you see this example of a union that's retrograde, that's hurting social justice, and you have to try to reconcile them, and I think mm -hmm. it creates cognitive dissonance for a lot of us, but we have to recognize that they, they, they have a special breed 
kind of a labor union thing going on with the police the uh, department and unions. I mean, you know, some of the things that some of the heads of the, these police unions say after some of the greatest tragedy are outrageous, just jaw dropping. And they seem completely insulated from any accountability or responsibility. So it, yeah, that, that we, 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 a lot to get to on that. I'll stop there. Um, we are just about out of time. I feel like we opened up a big can of worms and um, we, we don't have any real solutions to put into place today. But um, one thing is to, you know, make sure you vote in November. <laughs> That's the first step. And, um, you know, we are really thrilled to have so many people. We have about uh, 400 people who listen to this conversation. We're really, um, you know, just so honored to have, you know, some of these nation's experts with us to talk about these very pressing issues um, that are going on and don't appear to be um, subsiding um, at the moment. So uh, I do hope that you'll follow up with the sentencing project and everyone who attended. I know I didn't get to everybody's questions by far. Um, and I want to thank all the panelists so much uh, for spending your time with us. And um, this, re this, will be re uh, this recording will be available um, and for anyone who was not able to join. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And take good care. Bye. Thank you.